Good morning. I want to welcome you guys to our gathering here at Southside this morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, I'm glad to have this opportunity to come together with my church family and to worship God with you. If you're a guest with us this morning, I want to just tell you to make yourself at home. If you need anything, ask us around you, and we'll be glad to help you in any way we can. Um, real quick, we'll point your attention to the um, bulletin. One quick reminder from the announcements. Um, we have VBS volunteer sign-up in the foyer. So if anybody wants to help with that, um, for teaching or for any other roles that we have out there, you can check that sheet in the foyer um, to help us out with VBS this year. Also, registrations are online, and also there's a sign-up sheet outside in the, in the foyer as well uh, to register for VBS. Those dates are July 9th through the 13th. All right, as we begin in worship this morning, I want to read from Psalm 119, verses 35, sorry, 25 to 32. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the ways of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Good morning. Let's stand together as we start to sing this morning. We're going to start with this old hymn, Free from the Law, this morning. Let's stand together as we sing. Free from the law, oh, happy condition, Jesus has bled and there is remission, cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all, once for all. try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Well, your pastor, our pastor, is away today uh, going down to the Southern Baptist Convention. I'd ask you to pray for him and pray for the convention this, uh, this week as they meet. Uh, lots of stuff going on there uh, in New Orleans. 
Um, so let's go together uh, to the Lord in prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. For yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honors come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Lord, we invite and we implore you to rule over this worship service. And to guide us to worship you in a way that is acceptable to you. May your name be exalted as we sing, pray, preach, listen, give, and respond today. And Lord, may we not hear your words and think that they apply to other people. But may we have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us. And Almighty God... This moment, we intercede for people who don't know you. May your word and spirit convict of sin and Christ's righteousness and the judgment to come. And may you draw men and women, boys and girls to yourself, just as you have promised to do. But Lord, we don't demand or command you to do anything. We simply humbly ask, according to your perfect will, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Galatians 3 said that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. Let's stand back again and sing thank you, Jesus, for the blood this morning. I was a wretch. I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your sight So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside There at the cross You paid the debt I owed Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus It has washed me white Thank you, Jesus You have saved my life Brought me from the darkness Into glorious light Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the For the blood applied Thank you, Jesus It has washed me white Thank you, Jesus 
Jesus, you have saved the night, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder work and power of the That calls us sons and daughters We are ransomed by our Father Through the blood The blood There is nothing stronger Than the wonder work and power of the blood The blood That calls into glorious light glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied Glory to his name. Amen. You may be seated. see was the struggle haunted by glows that lived in my past bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last? Then you looked at this prisoner and said to me, son, stop fighting your fight, it's already been won. I am redeemed. Set me free, so I'll shake off these heavy chains and I'll wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed, oh God redeemed. All my life I have been called unworthy Named by the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper, child lift up your head I remember, oh God you're not done with me yet. I am 
I'm redeemed, you set me free, so I'll shake off those heavy chains and I'll wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be, because I don't have to be the old man inside of me Cause these days are long dead and gone Cause I've got a new name and a new life I'm not the same and a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off those heavy chains and I'll wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off those heavy chains and I'll wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be, oh God, I'm not who I used to be, Jesus, I'm not who I used to be, cause I am redeemed, thank God. Redeemed. A man named Robert Benchley is credited with the quote of saying, There are two types of people in the world. Those who divide the world into two types of people and those that don't. Uh, let that sink in for just a moment. But today, as we enter into this time of, uh, of preaching and listening, I, I want you to um, just spend a moment. All of us just take just a brief moment. Um, I'll ask you even to close your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head and raise your hand and all those kind of things. But I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes right now. All of us just close our eyes. And I want to just ask this question of us today and us allow the Holy Spirit to work in, in my heart right this moment. I'll ask this question Am I genuinely a believer? Am I genuinely a believer? Am I truly saved or not? Okay, you can open your eyes now. If you've lived long enough, you've seen it, or even worse, you've lived it. Families that used to be loving and harmonious and got along real well together implode after grandma and grandpa pass away and the inheritance is divvied up. And we've probably all known children whose choices and lifestyles have ostracized themselves so much from their parents that they were written out of the wills. What would have, could have, should have been theirs was passed on to another sibling. Did y'all know that God has an inheritance awaiting his children? There is an inheritance waiting for us. The difference is his children receive the inheritance when they die. So here's the vital question as we go back to the two people idea. Are you positioned to receive God's inheritance? Are you positioned today so that when you die, you will receive God's inheritance? Who's in? Who's out? And why? That's going to be our 
theme today as we're looking uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles or your devices or whatever it is that you turn on to look at God's Word, I'd ask you to look there now. And in honor of God's Word, I would ask that we stand as I read today's text. First Corinthians chapter 6, I'll be reading today from the English Standard Version, and we will read verses 9 through 11. Paul writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Don't miss that. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and... By the Spirit of our God. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, please open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear. Father, may we not be focused on performance. May we yearn and long for your presence today. God, we we ask, we humbly ask that you sharpen us, that you convict us, that you encourage us, that you draw lost to yourself. Lord, we ask that you be the focus of these, these next minutes. And God, help us to pay attention, not to be concerned about what we'll do this afternoon or tonight or all the things that lie before us this week, they will all still be there. So thank you for this word that you've preserved for us today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So I don't know if you're the kind of person that likes women's uh, softball, girls' softball, college softball. Um, I've grown to really, really like that. And this uh, past couple of weeks, we've ha- had an opportunity. You have had the opportunity to watch the World Series, the College World Series. And uh, if you keep up with that at all, you know that Oklahoma girls' team, they are stout. I mean, they are incredible. They won two national championships back-to-back. They were going for the third national championship uh, just this past week. They had only lost one game all year. Going into the final game, I think their record was 59-1 and one or something like that. 59 wins and only one loss, and they've won like 50-something in a row. Amazing. And if you watch these girls play, uh, they play with, as someone in my Sunday school class said this morning, they play with great assurance, uh, a little cocky, but that was okay. Um, then they won the national championship this past week, and, and at the, um, I don't know if you saw this, but at the press conference afterwards, there were three girls seated behind the table, uh, and plus uh, their coach, Patty Gasso, was on the other end, and the, the, conf- the, the press conference was about 30 minutes long, but there was a segment of about three minutes where uh, a, a member of the press asked this question, said, you know, it, it, you, you've had the, the target on your back all year long, and, and you know, you're expected to win, and surely there's been anxiety. How, how have you maintained the joy that you seemingly have been able to keep during this whole season? And the first girl that answered said, the only real joy is in the Lord. 
And she says this was all, with all the national cameras and all the national press on her. And then she goes on and she says, you know, uh, happiness is not the same thing as joy. And I'm paraphrasing now. But she says happiness is situationally based. You can be happy one minute and sad the next. Happiness doesn't last. Joy is an underwriting, undercurrent truth in Christ that we have no matter what the situation might bring. And she didn't say it that way, but that's pretty much what she said. And then they go on to the next girl, and they ask her the same question. The next girl points to her, and she says, I 1,000% agree with what she just said. And she says, I was on that team that won the national championship two years ago, and it, and it was happy for one night, but the next day I woke up, and it was like, something's missing. There's a void there. I'm no longer, I'm not, I'm not really joyful. I should be. And then she went on, she said, I found that true joy. In Christ. And I thought, man, I love me some Oklahoma girl softball now. I mean, you know, when we, when we hear and see so much filth and trash and just, just awful stuff in the news and on social media, to hear these girls exalt the name of Christ in front of thousands and thousands of people, uh, our God is still on the throne. Amen. Well, we're talking about this joy today. And in these verses that Paul gives, you say, hold on, that those verses didn't talk about joy. In fact, it sounded like it talked about exactly the opposite. Oh, uh, far be that from the truth. It does talk about joy. Paul provides this logical reasoning why we should and can be filled, not with happiness all the time. Because you're, you're not going to be happy all the time, Right? I don't care who you are, you're not going to be happy all the time. But there is a joy that each of us will and can possess that will get us through life no matter what the situations are. And I want to summarize this logic that Paul brings to this argument with three timeless propositions. We're going to break this down into three propositions of, of this joy. Why and how that we can have this joy. Number one is this. Here's the first proposition. The unrighteous do not receive God's inheritance. The unrighteous don't receive God's inheritance. That's what he says right there in verse 9. You know, it's pretty straightforward. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous future will not inherit the kingdom of God? Back to those two kinds of people. So Paul here is saying there are two kinds of people. There are the unrighteous and there would be the opposite of that, the righteous an unrighteous person is someone who, who is not right with God. Just look at it like that. There's some people who are right with God. There's some people who are not right with God. The unrighteous will not receive the kingdom of God. And that's just shorthand in this text for God's inheritance. The unrighteous are ostracized sons and daughters. And they will never be written into the will. And then Paul goes on, he says, don't be deceived. What's he mean by that? There's a lot of people that are deceived who are thinking that, well, I'm going to receive that inheritance. For sure I'll get that inheritance because I grew up in church. I've been at church ever since I've been this age. And now I'm 75 years old. For sure I'm going to receive that inheritance. Or we look back and we say that I've walked an aisle when I was a youngster. For sure, I'm in, right? I'm receiving the inheritance. I remember walking the aisle. Or I raised my hand at youth camp. Remember? Around the fire, the kumbaya, and raise your hand if you just need forgiveness. And I raised my hand, and so I'm counting on something that I've done, raising my hand to get me in line for God's inheritance. And Paul is saying, don't be deceived. God is not capricious. He's not a good old grandpa who in the end just gives in to equity. When it's all said and done, he just winks at sin and says, Oh, everybody, just come on in. I'm that kind of a God. So it begs the question, what does unrighteousness look like? Brings me to the second proposition, and that's this. Disobedience to God's law is the chief trait of unrighteousness. Disobedience to God's law is the chief trait of unrighteousness. We see this in the second half of verse 9 and then all down 
through verse 10, and we're going to look at that. You know, nothing tarnishes the name of a parent more than a disobedient child. It's a direct affront to the parental authority, their wisdom, and their love as children disobey on a regular basis. Now look, some of you are going, oh no. I mean, every kid is going to disobey, right? I mean, it, it, at times. But if it, if it is the mm, character, mm, the, the trait of the child that they are continually disobeying, it just seems to bring this tarnished view of the parent. Well, in the second half of verse 9 and verse 10, Paul is going to flesh out what disobedience to, to God's law looks like. He lists these nine adjectives of disobedience. We could call these the nine marks of unrighteousness. And we're going to go over these. Because well, here's what we do. Now, maybe you're not like me, but I'm tending to look at a list like this and I'm going, wow. Those dastardly, sinful people. Those are those folks. You know, the kind of folks we don't want to be. We're not part of that. This list, I'm glad I'm not part of this list. I mean, just listen to how he describes these disobedient, unrighteous people. He first calls them sexually immoral. The word is porn a roy. That's where we get the word pornography from. If you go back and you look at, at, at where chapter 6 falls, it's kind of right in the middle. Well, it is not kind of in the middle of chapter 6 and 7. It's right in the middle of chapters uh, 5 and 7. It's chapter 6. And, and 5, 6, and 7 is all talking about or centered on this, uh, this sexual kind of scandal that was going on in their church. In fact, it was sexual immorality to the extent that even the Gentiles looked at it in disgust. So that's kind of the overall big context of what's going on in here. And Paul is saying the sexually immoral people, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, what we do, we, we tend to define immorality as anything worse than what we do. Anything worse than what I do would be immoral, but what I do would be okay. So now we're laser focused on the LGBTQIA plus community. We're focused on that and we say, well, that obviously is sexual immorality. But I'll remind you of this. Premarital sex is sexual immorality. I can't tell you the number, the, the last four or five couples that, that I married, that I had marriage counseling with, we had to talk through the idea that they were living together already you say well everybody does that that's just what you do now you live together and you just you see if you're compatible and that way you are you know you know forgetting about a divorce it would be inevitable so we just try it out no we don't living together before you're married is sexually immoral pornography is sexually immoral Viewing pornography, sexually immoral. Content on so much stuff that we see on our TVs or that streams on our internet services is sexually immoral. Are you feeling the heat yet? He goes on, he says, not only the sexually immoral will not inherit God's kingdom, neither will idolaters. Idolaters. Idolatry is having a love for anything in our hearts that holds a place that is equal to or greater than God. So it's not, it's not just simply, you know, I see a totem pole and I'm bowing down to this false god and therefore I'm an idol worship. No, that's not, that's not the whole nine yards. So, for instance, pleasure. If I have, if I'm seeking or in my heart... I enjoy pleasure as much or more than God. Pleasure is my idol. Pleasure could be, you fill in the blank, sports, hunting, work. You can make idols out of patriotism. I can love my community, or I can love my city, or I can love my state, or I can love my nation 
on a par that I love God or even greater than I love God, I make an idol out of patriotism. And here's one that you will even shudder at. Even family. I can make an idol out of my family. When I love my family on a par with the way I love God. Or even greater than I love God. Am I not supposed to love my family? Absolutely to love our families. But Jesus, at one point, he talks about, he says, they come to him and say, Jesus, your, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he says, that's not my brothers and mother. My mother and brothers are in here. And then he goes on, he says, in fact, if you don't hate your mother and your brother and your sister and your father, you're not, you're not able to come after me. Now, that's a, that's a Jewish idiom, right? He's not saying, like, to hate them, hate them. He's just saying, compared to your love for God is how much we would love our families. Does that make sense to you? So, idolaters. Third, adulterers. Well, according to Jesus, adulterers are those who lust in their hearts after anyone that is not their spouse. Jesus also taught that anyone who's been married, divorced, and remarried, unless biblically divorced, is an adulterer. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard in our culture. I'm just telling you what the law says. This is the law from God. It goes on, he says, those who practice homosexuality. I don't like that. I don't like the way that's translated. The original language doesn't have a verb in there. The original language just, just lists two people, two kinds of people. It describes all the components of a homosexual relationship, and I'll just leave it at that. Thieves. Thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does what's it mean to be a thief? It's pretty simple. Taking stuff that doesn't belong to you. So like stealing a car. Robbing a bank. What about playing on your phone at work? You're stealing time from your employer. That's stealing. What about... Viewing Netflix on someone else's account. That's stealing. What about not reporting the under table cash that comes in during the year? Not reporting that on your income taxes. Hmm. That's stealing. The law is a burden, isn't it? The more we understand about the law and we hear, uh, we hear these truths, it just kind of brings us further down and lower and lower. He goes on, not only will thieves not inherit the kingdom of God, the greedy will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who in their hearts want other people's stuff. Stuff that I don't have. If I want stuff that I don't have and it belongs to you, that's coveting, that's greediness. So it could be money or power or prestige, but also it could be kids that make all A's. Kids that make 1500 on their SAT. Kids that make the all-star team every time. Or could be greedy and want a voice in the public square that someone else has. Or might want someone else's life. I'd love to exchange someone else's life where they have no heartache, no problems, no pains. Uh, that's greediness. Drunkards. People that drink to the extent that alcohol controls you. Not people that self-medicate to fix their pain. So drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither will revilers. What is a reviler? Who is a reviler? A reviler is someone that criticizes in an angry or abusive way. You know, people like that, that are just super critical. It's almost like God gave them the, the spiritual gift of bad criticism. Always looking for something to criticize. Often it's tied with anger. So drunkards will not receive the kingdom of God. Revilers will not receive the kingdom of God. And here at this last adjective, the ninth one, he, he lists, he, he calls them swindlers. Swindlers. Hmm. 
interesting word, swindlers. Someone who cheats or exploits somebody else. See, there's a heart issue going on there. A swindler is someone who is really deep inside going, I've got to be best. So I'll cheat that person out of what he or she has. You see, each of these, they're, they're, as we look at the law and we look at sin, there's what we could call fruit sin. It's what we see in someone's life. But that fruit sin is always tied deep inside to a root sin. It's like the, you, you see an apple tree or, or peach tree or pear tree or something and, and, and the apples are they're just not looking good. You, wanna, you need to do something to it. So I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll fix that. And you go shake that apple tree and you shake them all off because they're all rotten. And you go to the grocery store and you buy some new Honeycrisp apples and it's really expensive and they're beautiful. And you climb up in the tree and you start trying to somehow attach those apples to that tree. You know that doesn't solve the problem. Why? Because the ultimate problem it's not a fruit sin. It's a root sin sin. You want to fix that tree, you need to get down to the root. And behind all of this stuff, all of this sin, it's not just the outward demonstration, it's, it's inward. It's our hearts that are the problem. Now, you might go, well, you know, that list it wasn't really all comprehensive, was it? No, it, it really wasn't. It's not a full list. But it is something that the Corinthians certainly identified with. In fact, Paul had earlier talked about that. Listen to these verses and just see if you pick up on some of the same words from chapter 5 that we just read in chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11 says this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. But he says this, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. Why? Or the greedies and swindlers or idolaters. Why is that the case? Because if you don't associate with those people, you're going to have to come out of the world. Because that's what the world is like. He says, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother. In other words, a person that is a member of your local church that says, I am a follower of Christ. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So, what can we conclude from this list? i tell you one thing I could conclude. If right now I just said amen and we went home and we would be of most people most miserable. Here's what we conclude. The law represents God's character. God is pure. He's holy. He's true. The law is moral. And failure to obey God's law is indicative of the unrighteous. It reveals hearts that are opposed to God. Let's go back to the logic, what we're talking about, right? Uh, there are people who are unrighteous who do not receive the inheritance of God. Now, we've gone on to that next uh, proposition, and the next proposition was this. Here's what it means to be unrighteous. Here's what it looks like, and we've listed these nine adjectives. They fail to keep the law. Does that make you uncomfortable? Do you feel the weight of knowing deep inside that you, too, fail to keep the law? So if we left here, it would not be a good place. A couple of weeks ago, we were, in Bush, we were at Bush Gardens up in Virginia, and uh, there's a roller coaster there that I, I really like. It's called Griffon. I don't know if you've ever ridden that. It's pretty cool. Um, but it's, it's probably like 12 seats um, in each row, maybe three rows, and it's a bit, it's a, just an amazing roller coaster, and you go do your thing, but you know, you start off, and you go, I mean, you go way up to the top, right? And you go around that turn, and here you come to that turn, and you know what's coming next. I mean, you know it's like boom, straight down, right? The only thing about the Griffon is it gets around there, and it goes, and you're stuck. And the first time I ever rode that thing, I'd never seen it. I never watched it. And we got up there, and we turned like that, and we stuck. And I was like, oh, Lord, please make this thing work. Please unfreeze it. I thought it was like the compactor at the dump that gets stuck all the time. Man, this thing, this thing was stuck. And you sit there for a good five, six, maybe even ten seconds. I don't know. And it goes. 
And if we read verses 9 and 10 and we just sit there a while and we simmer for a little while and we know something is not complete here, we're stuck and it's got to be more. It's got to release or else we are of all people miserable. Well, I'm glad to bring us to the third proposition and that's this. The good news is the righteous do. The righteous will inherit the kingdom of God or God's inheritance. Just listen to these verses. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says this, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, listen, to an inheritance. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, and he says this, But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. So what do we know just briefly about this inheritance that we will receive? It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. It is inseparably linked to Christ. And human reasoning cannot imagine it fully. Hmm. Follow me here. In verse 11, verse 9 and 10, he's listed these adjectives. Revilers, stealers, anybody want to, can you fill in any of the rest? Sexually immoral, homosexuals, all this kind of stuff. And then he goes and he says this, and verse 11, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. So what are we to make of that? Do we look at this list and go, wow, I'm glad he gave us that. And such were some of you. You know, some of you were like that, but not me. I'm getting into heaven that way because not me. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying, he's like, all of us are guilty. All of us fall under the condemnation of being guilty because of God's law. He's saying, and such were some of you. He's just making the point. Some of you were really racked by some of these particular kinds of sin. But all are guilty before God. Verse 11 now is really enlightening. Without getting into all the Greek translations and all that kind of stuff, I'll just just tell you this. Uh, In the Greek language, there are basically two ways to talk about the past tense. All right? There's present tense, there's future tense, there's past tense, and then two ways to look at the past tense. One is uh, you, you sort of look at what happened in the past as a snapshot. Another way is you look at something that happened in the past as like a video. So the snapshot happens one time, the video is like this continual thing, right? So, for instance, if I were to speak and say, he ran to the store. That would be one way of describing uh, a past action, right, that happened like one time. You you got that? But if I said, he ran the store, you get the difference. Running that store is like this continual thing that goes on. That's just what this person did for a living. He didn't just run to the store one time. He he ran the store as part of his, his life. Verse 11 is like that. When Paul says, such were some of you, he is using that past tense video view. You follow. He's saying, this is your life. This is indicative of what it's like to be lost. It's not, you don't just sin one time. It's your life. Because you're born separated from God, you are never pleasing to God. You're always pleasing yourself. It's who you were. And listen, this is good. This is where it gets good. In verse 11, he says, And such were some of you. What's the next word? But. There are several ways in the original language to say but, but this way to say but is like, hold on, hold on, hold on. You were this way, but. 
It's a strong contrast. But, and then look what happens. Now he lists these verbs and he, and he says, this is what happens. And these are, uh, these are the passive voice. You know what that means? Y'all remember that from like high school English? Remember what passive, what's passive voice? What's passive voice? Somebody. Oh, no, everybody here didn't flunk English. I know you didn't. Can anybody remember what passive voice is? Okay. Okay. Active voice is, Lori hit the ball. Lori hit the ball. Hit is the verb, and it is, it is active voice. She did the action. That's a big difference, right? Than Lori was hit by the ball, right? Was hit is the verb, and it's passive voice. That means it happened to her. She didn't do it. And guess what voice these verbs are in? But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. It wasn't you got this great idea one day that, you know what, I'm going to go out and get washed. I'm going to go out one day and get sanctified. I'm going to go out one day and get justified. No, this is God's work. God washed you. Revelation 7.14 says something like this. And he looked up in heaven and he saw all those who had been washed. Their robes were white. They had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You were washed. You were sanctified. That word, oftentimes when we talk about sanctification, right? We're talking about that process from the time I get saved until the time I go to heaven. And God is making me more and more like Christ. And that's sanctification. That's true. But this use of the word sanctified here it means to be set apart. It means to be chosen out. It means that you, listen, you, Christian, are the apple. You are the very apple of God's eye. That's how much you mean to Him. That's how much He loves you. That's how much He cares for you. That's how much He knows all about you. And He set you apart. He pulled you out of the muck and the mire, David would say. He cried out to God, and God reached down into the deepest pits of hell, into the muck and the mire, and he pulled him out, and he set him on a rock, and he put a new, a new song in his mouth. Praise to our God. Therefore, many will hear it and will tell others of him. He washed you. He sanctified you. Now listen to this. He justified you. Zach talks about it all the time in here, and you can't say it enough, and you can't preach enough. He justified you. God, when we put our, tr our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God legally declares you righteous. He said, but I don't feel righteous all the time. Well, take a number. Who feels it all the time? Our faith, our life, our future, our inheritance, listen, is not based on how we feel moment to moment. Our future, our inheritance, our joy is based on the fact of what God has done. Historical fact. God, the second person of the Trinity, takes on humanity, lived a perfect life, was sent to a cross, went voluntarily to a cross, was crucified for our sin. He was buried. He rose again. And by raising from the dead, God the Father was putting His stamp of approval on His Son. His sacrifice counts. It is enough. It is satisfactory. All who will put their trust in my Son shall be clean, shall be righteous. So when you put your trust in Christ, God at that moment, as God has set you apart, He's washed you, He's justifying you. Here's what God is doing. God is taking you from his, in His eyes and moving you from sinner to saint. That's who you are now. If you're in Christ, you are Saint Randy. <laughs> really? Saint West. Does that have a good ring to it? I mean, I know some of them is hard to imagine, right? Saint Jackie. That's an easy one to believe. But just go around the room. If you're in Christ, you're a saint. So I want to I want to take the last what, what? got one of these watches my kids gave me and I don't know how to make it work. It tells me how much I slept last night. And I'm like, why does that matter? I just 
I know I didn't sleep, so who cares? Um, so I'm going to take the last few minutes here and do a little teaching. Okay? Um, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about the law. Because, honestly, when we talk about the law, it can be a little bit confusing. At least for me. Right? People mention the law. What are they talking about? So I'm going to be kind of generic here, but, but clarify what is meant by the law. Generally speaking, there are three ways of looking at the law. Now, we could argue about this, but this is just, just for today. Follow me. Three ways of looking at the law, three types of law. One is ceremonial law. The ceremonial law are those laws that were given to Israel by which they worshipped God through ceremony. So, for instance, killing, sacrificing the animals was a ceremony. The ceremonial law has been abrogated. The ceremonial law is gone. Why? Because Christ fulfilled it. All of the ceremonial laws were shadows that pointed forward to Christ. Christ comes, He fulfills that law. That's why we no longer come here. Aren't you glad we don't come here in the morning and take a chicken and cut its head off here, you know, you know sacrificing chickens or lambs or something like that? We don't do that. Christ has died once for all. There's the ceremonial law, there's the civil law. The civil law refers to the laws that God imposed on Israel in order that Israel might live in the land. It's a topic for a whole other sermon. I won't go there. Um, there's some equity laws that we, could, we can gain from knowing the civil law. For instance, one of the civil laws, it talks about you need to build a parapet around your house. You know what that is? Any of y'all got parapets in your house? is like this thing up on the top of the roof because, man, then people had flat roofs and they'd get up there and in the nighttime they're walking around. It's not, they didn't have ambient light like we got and they'd be walking around and fall off. And so if you didn't have a parapet around your house, you're guilty of not being safe. So does that mean that we're supposed to build parapets at our house? No, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean that it's probably a good idea to put a fence around your swimming pool. So that's a, another way of looking at the civil law. It referred to Israel so they could live in the land. But third, it's the one that we really focus on here today. It's God's moral law. The moral law refers to all of the law that has been written generally on all of our hearts. It's universally known as right and wrong. And in fact, the Ten Commandments are a pretty good summary of God's moral law. In fact, if you look at today's text, you see how it kind of lays out. It's really close to those Ten Commandments. But listen, here's what's most important for you to take away from this. God's moral law is forever, forever binding on all people at all times. In simple terms, one must keep the moral law perfectly in order to go to heaven. Well, that just did about 100% of us out. You got to keep God's moral law 100% perfect all the time to get to heaven. So that brings us to another little question then. Well, how do we relate to this law now? The reformers did a pretty good job of this, and I'll just summarize. They looked at the law and they said, well, there's generally now three uses of the law, three ways to look at that, the moral law. And number one is really good news. The first use of the law, it takes us to the feet of Jesus. You see, because if you're like me and you just heard some preacher talk about all these kind of things you're not supposed to be, and you're like, man, I, I know it ain't supposed to be that way, but there is some covetousness. Yeah, there's some anger in my heart. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, I do that. And you're like, oh, no, what, what happens? And we just say this. The, 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 the law is like a thermometer. And your little kids are sick. You, 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 you know they're sick. You take the thermometer and, and, you go, and you go into the bathroom and grab that thermometer out of the whatever, whatever that thing's called. What's it called? Medicine cabinet. You pull that thing out. You shake it. Remember mama used to shake it, dip it down in alcohol and shake it. Yeah. Nowadays they got this fancy gun they shoot you with. So you go in there, you get your gun, and you say, oh, no, little Janie, I think you might be sick. And you take that, you take and shoot her in the head and you go, okay, you're all well now. That, that's not what the law does. The law is like that, not that it makes you well. Why? The law is like the gun because it shows you how sick you are. 
And you go in there and you pull that thing out of the medicine cabinet. You, you shoot little Janie in the head and it says 104.9. You say, oh no, we got to go somewhere where you can get fixed. We got to take you to the doctor. And that's what this law does for us. We read this law and it says you can't lie, steal, cheat, do all those kind of things. And you go, oh no, I'm so guilty. And that law is shining on me and it's showing how guilty I am. And it says you got to go somewhere where you can be healed. You got to go somewhere where you can be saved. You got to go somewhere where you can be forgiven. You got to go sit at the feet of the doctor. And the doctor is Christ Jesus the Lord. And the law drives us to the feet of Christ. This is what it means to be righteous. Not that I'm righteous in myself, but God has accredited the righteousness of Jesus to me. The second use of the law is kind of what is referred to as common grace. It's basically used to prevent chaos. Can you imagine what this world would be like if nations didn't at least somehow codify the law of God into laws of their land? Most nations you go to, their laws against murder. There's laws against rape. There's laws against theft. All that kind of stuff. Well, God has given that law in a common kind of way, even to unbelievers, to keep the world from just going totally crazy. Third, a third use of the law, it's the Christian's guide for living. Right? We don't do away with God's moral law. It's binding on us, but it's not binding on us to earn our way to God and salvation. It is God's way of showing us how we are to live. That old unrighteous nature, we couldn't love God. That old man was marked by sin. But saved people love God and we cannot sin willfully with no sorrow or remorse over our sin. So, for instance, a Christian may lust or cheat or steal, but it doesn't characterize our lives. It's not what we do in an unbroken kind of way and that we're never you know, convicted of that or upset over that. It means when we do sin, we're remorseful and we repent and we seek God's forgiveness. So Christians don't look at the law so much as restrictive, but as it is good. David would say this, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So a couple of final applications and I'm done. So what? So what? We heard this stuff. What do I take out of here? What do I do with this? Well, one, we can view people other people understanding that you know what I was like that such were some of you we were once enslaved to sin you know what those lost people they're enslaved to sin they are Satan's POWs lost people listen this is a news flash lost people act like lost people because they are lost people In such, knowing that in your lives you are surrounded, you are, you are surrounded by people who need that forgiveness and who need Christ, we should and always ask God, Lord, please, today, make me a conduit of your grace. Make me a conduit of your love. Make me a conduit of your forgiveness. Make me a conduit of, of peace, joy, love, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Lord, just make me that pipe and, and send that through me into somebody's life so that you might reach a person for Christ and then be bold and get off the sidelines another way of applying this ask God to create a love in our heart a deep love and our wills for his law because his law is healthy and it is good and listen wherever you struggle with sin ask God just just pray this way God Would you please create in me a love for your law and a love for obeying you that gives me, that completes a deep sense of joy, that that level of joy is greater than a temporary fleeting happiness with sin. See, sin can make you happy. Sin can be pleasurable for a little bit. That's how we should be praying. 
you know what? There's some of you here today, just by the law of averages, I would say, you'll not receive God's inheritance because you're still dead in your sin. You love sin more than you love God. And be not deceived. God is not a capricious old grandfather. When it's all said and done and they drop you six feet under and kick dirt on you, he'll go, come on in anyway. You may have heard this before. But there was an extremely wealthy man who in his will said he had had a son previously. His, his son had died early, and uh, so he had no heirs. So when, it, when he died, it was in his will that all of his estate would be auctioned off. An extremely wealthy man. So you can just imagine all the people that were gathered there to, to buy the stuff. The auctioneer steps up and he says, before we uh, actually get into the bidding here on, on the, the valuable stuff, there's a crude drawing of this man's son that, that uh, is in this uh, picture frame up above the fireplace here. He said that we, we need to just go ahead and auction this off before we enter into the real bidding. Well, nobody was listening. Nobody cared. So the auctioneer opened the bidding. One person bid. She bought that crude, rough pencil drawing of that man's son for a dollar. When he, the auctioneer slammed the gavel down and said, sold to her for one dollar, and the auction is over. And there was quiet amazement. And he said, as directed in this gentleman's will, whoever had the son has the inheritance. For one dollar, this woman purchased the entire inheritance. Now the analogy breaks down, right? We don't buy Christ for a dollar. Salvation isn't easy, willy-nilly. Just raise your hand. But listen, don't ever forget this, brothers and sisters in Christ. Whoever has the Son, or rather, Whomever the Son possesses inherits the inheritance. And eye has not seen nor ear heard what our God has laid up in heaven for those who are in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, our God, we give you praise, glory, honor, majesty today. Lord, all Everything belongs to you. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Christ who has washed us clean. We thank you for setting us apart. We thank you for declaring us righteous. God, please forgive us where we so many times fail and sin against you. But God, we thank you that when we do sin, that if we and when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God. Please work in our hearts, Lord, such that we will love your law more than we love the temporary pleasure of sin. And finally, Lord, I pray Lord, for those that are gathered here this morning who have loved and still love sin more than you, who are separated because they've never trusted Christ, Lord, I pray even now that you would move in the hearts of these people to drive unbelievers to their knees, that they might call on Christ, be forgiven, and be rightful recipients of your inheritance. With everyone still in a prayerful time, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. 
but I'm just going to share this with you in just a moment. I, I'm going to walk across the hall into the, the classroom across there, and as soon as we're done singing, if you just need someone to talk with, or even if you're saying, you know, preacher, I do need Jesus. I know were I to die this very day that I would not receive that inheritance, but I want to be part of that number. That I want you just to come over, and I want to just visit with you just for a moment over there. That, that invitation is open to you today. Lord, be exalted as we sing of your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand together as we sing. As we go today, we go telling, telling others about how love has lifted us today. Uh, let's sing it out this morning. But the master of 
you, you are dismissed.